What I will do is basically an introduction to an entire session about sex and gender differences in oncology. So my role is really introducing sex and gender sensitive medicine. So I don't go too far into oncology because a lot of uh, great colleagues will dive deep into what that specifically means for oncology. And I do a sort of umbrella presentation of what it means. So basically what I do is first of all, lay out why it is important to consider sex and ideally gender in, in oncology. So in how far do sex differences in genetics and hormones affect how diseases originate and how we potentially respond to diagnosis and therapy. Then I give a few bad examples of what can go wrong if you actually don't consider sex and gender differences in the planning of your research overall. So things that can go wrong is reduce the reproducibility, for example, because different animals or cells of different sexes might react differently in experiments. Um, if you don't consider gender also, you might have barriers that are specific to the access to your research, to your trial for women and men. And if you don't consider those, your results will be more difficult to understand and to reproduce. The second point I'm making is, well, if you don't consider it, you might have issues with diagnosis. We know that um, there are delays in diagnosis that usually affect the patients of the gender that is least affected by a disease. So if a disease is typically female, and they say that in quotation marks, like for example, osteoporosis, men are highly underdiagnosed and not screened. When it comes to diseases like autoimmune diseases, which are much more prevalent in women, men are underdiagnosed. But then in a lot of other conditions that are typic more typically associated with men, cardiovascular diseases, for example, women tend to be diagnosed later. So this is a bias in the system. The third part I'm pointing out is um, the risks of algorithmic bias. We are moving into giant data, not just big data territory. Um, which is great on the one hand side because we have large data sets that allow us to find out a lot about associations that we couldn't have done in small samples. But what I try to point out is the analysis is only as good as the data we use. So if our data is um, initially biased, so we recruit certain types of individuals for our analysis and we are not aware of this bias, then a large data set might actually amplify these differences. And the fourth point is a serious risk of side effects or inefficacy of therapies for patients if they are not being recruited. And the example I make is um, the retraction of uh, pharmaceuticals in the United States at the end of the 90s. Um, there's about 10 drugs that have been retracted from the market. Women were much more affected by side effects. Some of these side effects were deadly. And this would have been at least in part preventable if women had been included in clinical trials appropriately. Um, and we would have investigated this before. So these are kind of the bad examples that I'm showing. And I hope to give people a bit of a wake up call here. And the last slide, really, the last thing I talk about is why is it relevant overall, apart from the examples I've brought and uh, well, funding agencies are picking up on this and they have all kinds of different motivations. But what usually um, brings most of these motivations together is a hope to increase reproducibility and rigor of research to make it excellent through more reproducibility and rigor. And the last point is really societal relevance. Um, if we consider that uh, the therapies we develop, the care we give should be available to all and should be best suited for everybody, then we need to take all of these variables into account when we plan our experiments and our trials.